The greatest day in history Death has beaten, you have rescued me Sing it out, Jesus is alive The empty cross, the empty grave Life eternal, you have won the day Shout it out, Jesus is alive He's alive You have washed my sins away, oh, happy day, happy day, I'll never be the same, oh, happy day, happy day, you have washed my sins away, oh, happy day, happy day, I'll never be the same, forever I am changed. Jesus, you are mine. And this joy, perfect peace. Celebrate, Jesus is alive. He's alive. Oh, happy day, happy day. You have washed. Happy day, I'll never be the same. Oh, happy day, happy day, you have washed my sins away. Oh, happy day, happy day, I'll never be the same. Forever. What a glorious way that you have saved me. Oh, what a glorious day. What a glorious day. the 
same oh happy day happy day you have washed my sins away oh happy day happy day now never be the same forever i am changed i'll never be the same and i will call upon the lord who is worthy to be praised i will call upon the lord who is worthy to be praised so shall i be saved from my enemy the Lord liveth, and blessed be my rock, and let the God of my salvation be exalted. The Lord liveth, and blessed be my rock, and let the God of my salvation be exalted. And I will call upon the Lord, who is worthy to be praised. I will call upon the Lord, who is worthy to be praised. So shall I be saved from my enemy. For oh, the Lord, and blessed be my rock, and let the God of my salvation be exalted. The Lord liveth. And blessed be my rock, and let the God of my salvation be exalted. Oh, the Lord liveth. And blessed be my rock, and let the God of my salvation be exalted. The Lord liveth. And blessed be my rock, and let the God of my salvation be exalted. Before I spoke a word, you were singing over me. You have been so, so good to me. Before I took a breath, you breathed your life in me. You have been so, so kind to me. And oh, the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God. Oh, it chases me down, fights till I'm found, leaves the 99. I couldn't earn it, I don't deserve it, still you give yourself away. Oh, the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God. Ooh. When I was your foe, still your love fought for me. You have been so, so good to me. When I felt no worth, you paid it all for me. You have been so, so kind to me. Though the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God Oh, he chases me down, fights till I found leaves. The 99, I couldn't earn it, I don't deserve it. Still, you give yourself away. Oh, the overwhelming, never ending, 
reckless love of God. Oh, oh, oh. There's no shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up, coming after me. There's no wall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down, coming after me. There's no shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up, coming after me. There's no wall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down, coming after me. Oh, the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God. Oh, he chases me down, fights till I'm found, leaves the 99. I couldn't earn it, I don't deserve it, still you give yourself away. Oh, the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God. Chases me down, fights till I'm found, leaves a 99. I couldn't earn it, I don't deserve it, still you give yourself away. Oh, the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God. There's no shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up, you're coming after me. There's no wall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down, coming after me. There's no shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up, coming after me. There's no wall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down, you're coming after me. You coming after me? Oh, the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God. Oh, he chases me down, fights till I'm found, leaves the 99. I couldn't earn it, I don't deserve it, still you give yourself away. Oh, the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God. Thank you, Jesus, for your sacrifice. Thank you, Lord, for never giving up, never giving up on me. Thank you, Jesus, for everything you've done for us and all you've gone to. Thank you for chasing us, for loving us, for feeding you. Oh, the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God. Oh, it chases me down, fights till I'm found, leaves in 99. I don't earn it, I don't deserve it, still you give yourself away. Oh, the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God. The Holy Spirit is here. Brand new earth quaked before 
moved by the sound of his voice. Seas that are shaken and stirred can be calmed and broken for my regard. Through it all, through it all, my eyes are on you. Through it all, through it all, it is well. Through it all, through it all, my eyes are on you. And it is well with me. Be it from me not to believe, even when my eyes can't see. And this mountain that's in front of me will be thrown into the midst of the sea. Through it all, through it all, my eyes are on you. Through it all, through it all, it is well. Through it all, through it all, my eyes are on you. It is well, it is well. So let go, my soul, live trust in him. The waves and winds still know his name. So let go my soul and trust in him. The waves and winds still know his name. So let go my soul and trust in him. The waves and winds still know his name. So let go, my soul, let trust in him. The waves and winds still know his name. The waves and winds still know his Let me ask you this morning, how is your flame doing? Have you been working on your flame this week? Is it growing in intensity? Or is it smoldering? And just kind of a couple little embers sitting over there. How is your flame? You know, with all of us here together, 
this place ought to be a spiritual inferno this morning. That's what it should be. When we're together as the body of Christ and we've been fanning that flame into a big roaring fire, when we're together, it should be an incredible spiritual inferno in the name of Jesus. Amen? The Apostle Paul gives us a lot of challenging words throughout the entire New Testament. He, directed by the Holy Spirit, he wrote like half of the New Testament. And he gives us a lot of things to chew on. And chew we have been doing since the beginning of the year, but certainly with this whole series on spiritual gifts, we've been just chewing away at them. But he also gave us the words we talked about last week. Fan into flames the gift of God. I hope we're taking that to heart. I hope we didn't just walk out of here last Sunday and go, yeah, fan into flames, that's kind of cool. I hope we're really applying that to our lives. I hope day after day we're saying, Lord, uh, uh, the fires, you know, it's, I, I need some more. I, I, help me, Lord, to get this flame moving. Any of you ever watch Survivor, the show Survivor? I, I love Survivor. I, I think it's a great show. If you're familiar with the show, you'll know at the end there's a fire building challenge. Who can build a fire faster? We should have that competition here. Who can build a fire in your life faster? That should be our goal. That should be what we're striving for and running afterwards. Those, those words, those fan into flame words should provoke a lot of thoughts in our hearts and minds. They shouldn't just be, oh yeah, I know that scripture. Oh hey, that's kind of a neat phrase. They should really be provoking us to think a little bit. What does it mean to, to build that flame, to fan that fire? How do I fan that flame? How do I get that fire to, to roar and to move? And what evidence is there of that flame growing in my life? Or what evidence is there of that flame slowly diminishing in my life? We don't want to look at it that way. We want to think about building up. But what evidence is there of all that happening in my life? Today we're going to start our way through yet another list that is given to us in Scripture. Another list written by Paul. Another list that speaks of the evidence of the Holy Spirit in our lives. And a list that honestly helps us to measure that growth. How intense are our flames? How much are they growing or roaring? I tried to combine them together there. Did you catch that? Roaring? We'll put that as a new word, groaring. Today we're going to be reading a letter that Paul wrote to the Galatians. So if you want to flip open there, we'll get to that in just a minute. But he wrote to the Galatians. Now it's important that we understand these words that he wrote are very important. They mean a whole lot. And yet there's a basic element to these words that he speaks to us as well. It takes us down to a little bit of, of, of elementary truth, which is really what he intended. He wanted his readers, his hearers, to go back to the basics. What is it that's important? What is it that matters? Why do we do what we do? He wanted to emphasize the basic, which is what? The gospel message. It's not, about, it's not about rituals, it's not about traditions, it's not about your opinion, my opinion, somebody else's opinion. It's about the basic truth of Scripture, which is the gospel of Jesus Christ. For the Galatians, they were dealing with a whole lot of legalism. You have to do this, you have to do this, it has to be this way, it has to be that way. They were putting all these rules down, which we call legalism. Instead of worrying about the, the elementary, the basic truth of what needed to, to be followed, they wanted to make it more difficult. So Paul was addressing their problem, their issue, and he reminded them about their faith. Simply put, he says, how we are supposed to live. 
It's not about following this rule and that rule and the next rule. Now, don't misunderstand me. There's, you know, moral law and there's, there's laws and rules that, yes, we do need to pay attention to. But he, they were trying to attach all these other things. You know, you got to do it this way or that way. Or Paul was saying, you know, listen, get back to the basics, folks, and live a life that you are supposed to live In fact, the title of the section of Scripture that we are about to read is called Life by the Spirit. Life by the Spirit. I mean, the title alone should speak volumes to us. The title alone should tell us the importance of what Paul is about to communicate. Life, our life should be all about living in accordance with the Holy Spirit. That's what our life should be like or what it should be about, folks. It shouldn't be about what I can save up for or how high I can climb on the corporate ladder or or what I get to do this week or next week or next summer. Our, Our life isn't about setting those meaningless goals. Sure, they're fun and they're exciting and we enjoy doing those things. Don't misunderstand me, not a problem with them. But that's not what our life is supposed to be about. We, as believers, are supposed to live a life according to the Holy Spirit's direction. Are you all hearing me this morning? Because you're awfully quiet. Let's read Paul's words. Galatians chapter 5, starting at verse 16. So I say, live by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the sinful nature. For the sinful nature desires what is contrary to the Spirit, and the Spirit what is contrary to the sinful nature. They are in conflict with each other, so that you are not to do what you want. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. The acts of the sinful nature are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity and debauchery, idolatry and witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissension, factions and envy, drunkenness, orgies and the like. I warn you, as I did before, that those who who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the sinful nature with its passions and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking and envying each other. I said we're going to start going through another list just a moment ago, and that list should be pretty obvious now that we have read through this section of Scripture. But before we get into what Paul calls the fruit of the Spirit, we're going to dig this or or dissect this section of Scripture just a little bit today before we go digging through that list. The very first thing that Paul says to do is to live by the Spirit. Now, I have to confess to you this morning, I've done this before, but I'm going to reiterate it so you remember. I am not a literary or English scholar. English was probably one of my worst subjects in school. So I don't get the whole idea of grammatical structure, sentence structures, and and how they're put together and tenses. That's just not me. I don't get it. But I have studied and I have learned over time, especially when it comes to the original language, that the way things are written take on certain meanings. And in this case, that live by the Spirit phrase that 
that we have in our English translation should maybe be better phrased, keep on living by the Spirit. Because it's supposed to be a continuous event. Paul is telling us that we cannot be satisfied with a past tense version. I used to live by the Spirit. Or I'm going to live by the Spirit. Or occasionally I live by the Spirit. Paul is saying we must continuously live by the Spirit. That's what he was directing the church, uh, the Galatians. And that's what he's telling us. Don't give up. Don't stop. Don't back away. But you have given, been given new life in Christ. And from that moment on, you should be striving to live in accordance with the Holy Spirit. Not from time to time. Not from 7 a.m. to 8 a.m. when you have your quiet time. Not when you're on the expressway and everybody around you is driving brilliantly. Not when you're at the store and you're the first person in the checkout line. But we are supposed to walk by the Spirit always. Continuously. Forever. Maybe do this. When you stand up to walk out today, And for the rest of the week, every time you take a step, go with the Spirit, with the Spirit, with the Spirit, with the Spirit, with the Spirit. Maybe that'll help us to remember how we're supposed to walk. And it's not just with the Spirit, but it's constantly, it's always. That is part of what we are supposed to do as Christians. The pursuit of a life lived in the Spirit must be constant. Must be constant. It doesn't take a break. It doesn't slow down. If we are to grow, if we are to mature, if we are to become who Christ wants us to be, then we must continue to walk in the Spirit. Why? Listen to Paul's very next statement. The spiritual nature desires, I'm sorry, back up. The sinful nature desires what is contrary to the Spirit. And the Spirit, what is contrary to the sinful nature. They are in conflict with each other so that you are not to do what you want. Folks, we cannot live both ways. You know, I think as believers, we have a basic understanding of heaven and hell. Those are the two choices. There is no in-between, right? When you die, when you take your last breath, you have a destination. Which one is it? Well, the same thing is true here about how we live our lives. We can live in accordance with the Spirit, or we can live in accordance with our human sinful nature. Which one is it going to be? There is nobody in this room that ever walks like this. We are going to walk a straight line either in step with the Holy Spirit or giving in to our fleshly human desire. Which way are we going to live In the life of every single believer, maybe you never knew this. Maybe you accepted Christ and you said, Lord, I'm a sinner. I I need you. I need your salvation. Please cleanse me. And nobody ever told you that from that moment on there was going to be conflict in your life. I'm here this morning to tell you there's conflict in your life. There's no escaping it. There's no getting around it. It's not going to stop. Someone told you Christian life is easy. They lied. This is a choice. It's a difficult walk. The reward is far beyond anything we can imagine, but it's going to take work on your part and on my part. In the life of every single believer, there is conflict. We are born as sinners. We inherently desire 
desire the, the things of the flesh or the things of this world. That's what attracts us. That's what's excited. Uh, that's what excites us. Again, think of all of those things. Greed, envy, go on to lust and sexual sins and everything else are stuff that we desire as sinners. And we've been there since birth. But once we became children of the living God, a conflict arose in our lives because the Spirit the Holy Spirit and the sinful nature are battling it out for you and for me. They are constantly working against each other. We inherently desire the sinful. We inherently desire the world or the flesh. And apart from God, we will get our just reward for desiring the sinful nature, which is eternal separation. From God. So if that's what you long for, if that's what you want, then the sinful nature is for you. I guarantee you, one second after you're experiencing it, you'll regret every moment of it. I know that sounds harsh, but it's true. Without God, there is no hope. Without God, there is no heaven for us. Without God, there is no eternity, streets of gold, joyful eternity, streets of gold, lack of sorrow. Without God, none of that stuff exists for us. Some of us experienced some of what we have just talked about here before we were saved. We were in abusive relationships or we were you know, out doing things we shouldn't do, lying, cheating, stealing, gossiping, whatever. All of those different things. Some of us were involved in that kind of stuff prior to our salvation. But once we accepted the Lord, we should be moving way away from those things. Scripture says, everything that the Spirit desires, the Holy Spirit desires, is contrary to what the human sinful nature is desires. If we can learn to walk continually in the Spirit, then that sinful nature is going to be suppressed. That sinful nature is going to be overcome. That sinful nature is going to be pushed down. And the fruit of the Holy Spirit, as Paul calls it, will be evident in our lives as we learn to walk in step with the Spirit. If I haven't already made this clear, let me say it this way. If you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, if you have never experienced that idea of a new birth, then you have no conflict in your life. You have it easy. Because there's only one way you're going to live. And that's to please your flesh. That's going to walk with the world. That's going to be to be whoever the enemy, Satan, convinces you to be. If you have never accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you are conflict-free. Enjoy it. Once you learn what that actually means, it takes on a whole new understanding in your life. I would choose the conflict any day over what waits for those that don't know Christ as their Savior. I would live 120 years with that conflict over an hour with separation from God. Think about that for a little bit this morning. The crux of today's text is all about the fruit of the Spirit and displaying that fruit in our lives. Yet there's some things we need to understand about the fruit of the Spirit. When we place our faith, our hope, our trust in our Savior, we are not forced to change. God does not come down instantly and recreate who you are and make you some robot that's going to follow him without thought or clue or issue. That's not how it works. 
there's still an element of free will in our lives. And when we come to know Christ, that's a choice. That's a decision. And from that moment on, we have to make choices and decisions that continue to lead us in His direction. So we have to continue to choose to do what God wants us to do. We're not programmed mannequins of some sort. We have to surrender. We have to choose whether we're going to walk in the ways that the Word instructs us to walk or continue in the flesh. If we continue to walk in the flesh, we'll be guilty of all those wonderful things that Paul lists. Sexual immorality, impurity and debauchery, idolatry and witchcraft, hated, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. That's not a complete list either, by the way. I think Paul hits about every element of our lives in that list in some way. But that's not a complete list. And then his very next statement. Oh my word, if we haven't already started to panic a little bit, the very next statement ought to just push us over the edge. I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. That scripture does not say may not inherit. That scripture does not say God will think about whether or not he'll accept you. That scripture does not say if you do enough good stuff here on earth, then we'll make it better and you'll be okay. God said if that's the life you choose, if that's the way you're going to live, if the sinful nature is what you want to please, then don't plan on seeing me in the future. Don't plan on walking those streets of gold. Don't plan on those tears being wiped from your eyes. Don't plan on that peace reigning in your hearts. If you want to live like that, then that's how you're going to live and you're going to deal with it. I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. Paul doesn't mix words. He tells it very straight. He tells it as it is. He tells it very simply. If you're going to choose that nature, so be it. Then you're going to get your just reward, so to speak. If we keep pursuing and living according to the Holy Spirit, then we will receive all that God promises to us in Scripture. All that God promises to us in Scripture when we continue to walk in step with Him. There will be noticeable change in our lives. Why? Because we'll be living as examples of Christ. We'll be living the way the Holy Spirit is directing us to live. We'll be living the way the Word of God has said we're supposed to live. And that my friends, is the list that Paul gives us next. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Those things we call the fruit of the Spirit. Now, once again, I guess I should point this out real quick. Just as we said with the gifts of the Spirit, the gifts that are listed are, are probably not a complete list. There are more gifts. Same thing could be said about the fruit. There's nine listed here, but not sure this is actually a complete list of every virtue or every element of the life we're supposed to live. It's also a good point or a good time to point out something that we often overlook. While there are many acts of the sinful nature listed in Scripture, again, the list we read is only a partial list. There are a lot of others listed in Scripture. But there are many acts of the sinful nature listed. Did you know that there is only one fruit listed? 
take that in for a second. Look at what Scripture says. But the fruit of the Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit. It is singular. There is no S. We often refer to it as the fruits of the Spirit, but that is incorrect. It is the fruit. One. They are not independent from each other. They are all together working and functioning together to represent the Holy Spirit. There are nine virtues listed here and perhaps others implied as I just said. But there are nine here that are examples of Christ, the individual single person, Jesus. All of them represent Him. It is the fruit of the Spirit. Unlike the gifts, or you may have one or two or multiple gifts, but never all the gifts, when it comes to the fruit of the Spirit, every single element of them should be evident in our lives. We don't get the option to say, man, I'll love people all day long, but I cannot be patient with them. Not a choice. Not a choice. We don't get to say, I'm going to live in joy and look at me because I am just the joyful guy who is greater than anybody else. No, humility comes in there too. Nine virtues listed, but they are inseparable. They are the fruit of the Holy Spirit. They're a mark of a mature believer. When all of these attributes come together, when all of these attributes are evident in our lives, I guarantee you people will notice. I guarantee you people will look and say, wow, did you see how they handled that? Did you see how patient they are? Did you see how much joy just exudes from their life? Did you see how kind they are? People will notice when the fruit of the Spirit is evident in our daily lives. So that begs the question, when trouble comes, when difficulties make their way into our lives, how do we react? How do we respond? What is it that comes to the surface? Do we show the peace and joy of our Savior? Or do we revert back to the sinful nature of bitterness and envy and hatred and all of that fun stuff? How do we react when trouble comes our way? I heard uh, this expression and I thought this was great, so I wanted to share it with you this morning. When you squeeze lemons... You get lemon juice. You get whatever the juice of that particular fruit is that you squeezed. So what happens when you squeeze a Christian? Do you get Christ or something else? What happens when our lives are squeezed? Do we show Christ? Or do we revert back to that bitter envy, hatred, jealousy, rage. What is it that shows itself? One more small detail about these nine virtues that we read through this morning. We could, if we wanted to do this, we could break them down into three lists or three groups of three. The first one would be a more personal list Love, joy, and peace. That's supposed to be our life. Joy, not happiness. Joy, peace, love. And of course, we talked about that one, love. Love is the root of all of this. 
that agape, binding, sacrificial love. But those would be more of the personal element in our lives. And then the second list would be more of a outreaching list. Patience, kindness, goodness. How do we treat other people? Micah, I apologize. I am not always patient with my son. That's how I treat my son. Treating somebody else. Patience, kindness, goodness. The third, we could look at more of an upreaching list. Faithfulness, gentleness, or humility, and self-control. Now the interesting thing is each of these in a way, build on the next. When we learn in our own personal lives to walk in that love, joy, and peace, then we have a new outlook on others. And it's then that we can treat others with patience and kindness and goodness. We can treat them as they deserve. We can model Christ's life in us to treat them as they deserve. And as our walk with Christ continues to mature and our faith deepens, uh, we become more and more dependent on God. That's that element of faithfulness. We become and understand what it means to be humble before the Lord. We learn self-control or selflessness, if you will. And we learn how to overcome that sinful nature. Not on our own, of course, but because we are in step with the Holy Spirit and we strive to be who the Holy Spirit has called us to be, then we learn to push that sinful nature away. And we learn to keep in step with the Spirit. There is a battle raging in each of our lives. There is conflict day after day after day. You've seen it all your life. It started with those little cartoons of the angel and the devil sitting on the shoulder of somebody. Hey, do this. No, do this. Hey, look over here. No, do it this way. And we all realistically face that conflict in our lives. The human nature, the sinful flesh, is in opposition to the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is in opposition to the sinful nature. We are going to move one way or the other. Which way is it we are going to move? When people look at you, what do they see? What do they see? We were chatting this morning in Sunday school again about a few things, and I, I confessed something else in Sunday school. I internalize things all the time, constantly internalize things. When it comes to anger, I often thought I was doing good because I would just internalize it, and I wouldn't blow up, and I wouldn't yell at anybody. But I described what was really happening this way. I said, put a pot of water on the stove and turn that heat up. At first, it's just still water, right? But then down in the bottom, you see these little bitty tiny bubbles forming. And then those bubbles get a little bit bigger and a little bit bigger and, a little, and eventually it's just this rolling boil, right? Well, see, I always thought that I was doing a good job controlling my anger and stuffing stuff down inside. And the reality of it is, people still saw that I was angry. Eventually I blew up and it became real evident. But all along that whole time, people still saw my anger. They still saw that I was not happy, that things were, you know, that pot was heating up. And then they were on edge because they wanted to know when it was going to blow and who it was going to blow on. What will people see in your life? Do they see you living in accordance with the human nature? 
giving in to all those fleshly desires, doing what the world says is the best thing to do? Or did they see in you love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control? The fruit of the Spirit. What do they see? Our old sinful nature should not be evident to them. Our new Spirit-filled life is what they should see. Walk away today with one thought at least left in your head, if nothing else. If you've tuned out everything else this morning, if you've, I don't know, just decided this wasn't your message or for you, leave here with this this morning. Who is winning the battle that lies within? If you call yourself a Christian, there's conflict in your life. Who is winning that battle today? Who's going to win it tomorrow? Who's going to win it next week? Who's going to win it next month? Who's going to win it in five years from now? Sure. But who is winning that battle right now? Who's winning that battle today? Lord, help us to be victorious in the battle between our sinful nature and our spiritual life. God, help us to learn what it means to truly be an overcomer. To walk closer and closer and closer with you so that we can be further and further and further away from what the enemy is trying to do in our lives. God, help us to become the spiritual giants that you desire for each of us in our lives. Help us to be examples of you. Help us to speak and, and act and, and move in the power and presence of the Holy Spirit, not the weakness of the flesh. God, change us and move us forward, I pray. In Jesus' name. Amen. Draw me close to you. Never let me go. Nothing else could take your place. I feel the warmth of your embrace. Help me find a way. Bring me back.